March is National Reading Month, and a new documentary is bringing attention to why many children in this country are struggling to learn to read. According to the National Assessment of Educational Progress, only 33% of fourth grade children were reading at a proficient level in 2022. The film, The Right to Read, follows an activist, a first grade teacher, and two families in their fight to teach their students and children to read. The former host of Reading Rainbow, LeVar Burton, is one of the executive producers, and he, along with the film's director, sat down with CBS Mornings to talk about why so many students, still in this age, don't know how to read. I find it so hard to believe in 2023, Kids who are going to school, yes. LeVar, still can't read. That's true. Why is that? How we, is that possible? We have failed them in America, in our school systems. We have, we have failed them by not giving them evidence-based reading instruction. What we, does that mean? Well, we went the way on, they're being taught? Yes. We went on a tangent with whole language learning, which is to say you, you, you teach children to sort of memorize, mm -hmm. right, pictures mm -hmm. uh, and, and divine meaning from, from what they see on the page in terms of the images, not the letters. Yes. Phonics got abandoned. And, yes. and, and everything went downhill from there. I know, Jenny, there's a very powerful scene in the documentary where you see this little girl reading. And what she's doing is translating the pictures. When they showed her the words, she could not read. She could not read them. Exactly, Gail. It's, we naturally learn to speak, but yes. reading is a complicated task, and the brain isn't naturally wired to learn how to read. So we have to learn with systematic, explicit instruction. It's great to expose kids to books, yeah. but it's not the same as teaching them how to read. So while research shows student literacy rates are declining, some teachers say there's also a gender gap in reading engagement and achievement. A study from the National Center for Education Statistics found fourth grade girls had higher average reading scores than boys in the same grade in almost all of the 50 countries surveyed. Joining me now is Alexander Davidson, a high school English teacher uh, who's going to talk more about this. Thanks for joining us again, as Thank always. You. Uh, Mr. D, can I call you Mr. D? Absolutely. I know your students do. Uh, so you have a lot of experience with kids, you know, high school kids right now who already know very well how to read. But if they are struggling in their childhood or teenage years, this can very well be with them for the rest of their lives, right? Absolutely. Uh, so I've been teaching in an all-boys school for 13 years, and even during that, I got my master's in literacy education, and my final project was on boys and literacy. So this is very dear to my heart, and you just want that love of reading to spread to your students, but it's not always possible when they're coming in with some of these gaps that unfortunately happened before they even got to my classroom. So we want to make sure that these students who are having these experiences are having positive experiences. And unfortunately, boys more than girls are going to be more likely to back off from areas where they are not experiencing success. So when we see these low performance rates across the grade school levels, unfortunately, they've already decided, many by age 11, that reading isn't wow. for them and they don't want to read anymore. Uh, now, that's not to say they aren't reading anymore. They will read for school and if it's assigned, but the drastic drop is in students who are not picking up books for fun or treating reading as a hobby anymore. What do you think are some of the reasons we've gotten here? Some of it, the technology. I think a lot of us want to immediately go to the devices, the internet. It, it, it has changed the accessibility of just books all the time. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of the things that we have are over generalizations. Uh, literacy is such a complex issue that goes into race, socioeconomic status. Um, but with gender specifically, I think one of the major things is the incorrect uh, cultural stereotype that reading is a feminine activity. Mm -hmm. And boys aren't going to want to necessarily join in with something that they think is boring or nerdy. So we really want to change how reading is being portrayed in films and movies. Uh, but even down to the elementary school level, their first reading experiences are in the classroom where the majority of teachers are women. So the only time that they're seeing reading happen is with other girls. And so they may back off from that, um, but there are certainly boys who don't, which we love to see. 
Is that where that comes from? Just associating it with, with most teachers or women? Is, is it that simple? It seems like this day and age we would be kind of past this, right? You'd think. Um, what we really need is men to start stepping up and being reading role models for these students. Um, making sure that we aren't just picking up the books after the kids go to bed, that our children are seeing us reading for fun uh, down in the living room where everyone else is and talking to our nephews, our, the kids we coach about the books that they're reading and just yeah. making those activities more normal. So many people think that reading is such uh, an isolating experience and they're more drawn to social activities. But reading can be social if you're doing it in the right way and you've got that community built with you. Yeah, talk about that a little bit. I mean, it is difficult to tell your child to read more when they're like, I've never seen you with a book in your hand. Yeah, we have to set the standards. We have to set that up. So for example, in my classroom, I've got a bulletin board in the corner where I just post pictures of all the books that I've read so far this school year. And some of them are very intimidated and they're like, oh my goodness, I could never read that much. But it's not about quantity. It's about are you doing it? And so yeah. they see like, wow, here's someone that I like and admire. And if they're reading, then maybe that's something that I could be doing too. Yeah. Maybe they have a book that they could recommend me. Maybe we could form a bond over that. It's really a great experience. Yeah. What are some other ways you sell reading and sell books to young kids? You know, there are great stories out there. And some kids might not believe you if you say this is as entertaining or maybe even more entertaining than that video game or that show or that movie. I definitely try to brainwash my students into <laughs> believing reading is fun uh, and eventually they buy it and they believe me. Um, so we don't always have to be reading like the Captain Underpants or something to get their attention. Um, it's all in how you approach the book. So for example, I'll do Of Mice and Men and turn it into a murder mystery. Let's skip ahead to chapter five and take a paragraph and redact all of the important information out. But then from page one, they're kind of detectives looking at the characters, who's the victim, who's the murderer, and why would they do that? And all along the way, they're getting some of the same characterization skills that they would be getting if we just started on page one in a normal way. Yeah. But now it's fun, and it's a journey, and it's a puzzle for them to piece out. Are there specific books that you have recommended or that you have seen have kind of lit that fire for some of your students? Well, I know with my sophomores, uh, they really love Catcher in the Rye because Holden Caulfield is such a punk <laughs> and they just really can relate to him. And he's not Mr. Sunshine and he's not Mr. Positive, um, but he does lay out some truths that they're like, yes, I agree. But then they're also very willing to say like, mm, he's making some really poor choices here, <laughs> which is fun. Yeah, do you have any tips for parents if maybe they're looking for a book their child might be interested in? How do you take your child or your teen's interests and the things they like to do and translate that into this is a book they might enjoy. I think the easiest thing to do is just ask for help. There are so many websites out there that can recommend books um, and you can even search by interest, by genre, by category. Uh, there are organizations out there specifically to recommend these books, but also go to your local bookstore. There are people there waiting to put this book into your hand. Yeah. They have just been waiting for your ch child. They know, oh my gosh, have I got the one for you? And they don't get that option if you're just kind of, hmm, I'm gonna sit around and maybe hope my kid likes reading someday. Yeah. Like you've gotta take those first steps. Gotta take that initiative. All right, well, when we return, Alex does have some specific books he brought with us, and we're gonna take a peek at some of those that are sure to spark a passion for reading in young people. Stay with us. I don't know if there's been a better time to start a brand new news operation. The newsroom was pretty much starting from scratch. It's fresh, it's innovative. Lots of energy, lots of passionate reporters. Knowing what we're starting here puts so much joy in my heart. We have reporters who are embedded in these communities. Many people throughout St. Clair Shores have been fighting to save this water tower. If there's a miracle out there, get a hold of me. We are part of the neighborhood. Our newsroom is part of your neighborhood. Residents here on Stansbury say they are fed up with all this flooding that keeps happening. We shouldn't have to live like this. 
telling the stories that otherwise nobody would know about. Now, AJ, you went to the downtown boxing gym and you yeah. really got to see how this gym is impacting kids' lives. Yeah, Chris, as soon as I walked in the building, it was very uplifting. It is a boxing gym, but it's more than boxing. You know, we do homework, we help them with the SAT. When it comes to the weather, it's forecasting what's going to fall on your driveway, when is it going to happen, and how might it actually affect your day-to-day -day life. Hundreds of people continue to call in reporting problems throughout the county. Cleanup crews working all throughout Metro Detroit. Get them down and get them cleaned up. Local news to me means we're in your community, we're telling stories that matter to you, that affect you, that maybe we can get change and things done in your community. She was born without a, without an, a right arm, um, and then her legs didn't grow, I guess, the way that they should have. But for 20-year-old Fortune High School alum, Sumeya, she doesn't let that, or anything else for that matter, get in her way. So you have a favorite button over there. Yeah, you want to is it? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and... This is my favorite. I hope everyone watching that piece in particular says, I want to help that little girl and help that family and help get her to college. Well, we are rethinking the way local news is done in the 21st century and how to, how to tell the most important stories in a compelling way. You can get news anywhere, but for us, we're a fresh face with a new perspective and we're trying to make a difference in the community to tell stories that matter to you. I think we're here to listen and actually hear what you're saying and we're putting together a newscast that will show that. I want to tell those people stories because it's needed. Detroit is ready. Get ready because here we come. Reporting in Dearborn Heights. Live in Wayne County. Reporting in Adrian. Live in Livonia. Reporting from South Lyon, Kelly Vaughn. CBS, CBS News, News Detroit. Detroit. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them. <laughs> That was our Terrence Friday reading in a very entertaining manner to students at Stevenson Elementary School in Southfield. CBS Detroit visited them in honor of Read Across America Week. Terrence was joined by our own Amir Makeupson, as well as multi-skilled journalist Alicia Bergio and producer Kyra Azor, who you see reading right there. Once again, we are joined tonight by Alexander Davidson, a high school English teacher who also runs a book Instagram page called Mr. D Reads. And does he ever read? Mr. D, <laughs> tell us about some of these books you brought here that will spark a passion for reading in your students. So one thing you want to be careful about with the reading community is you can never ask them for only one recommendation because we cannot limit ourselves. Yeah. So I've brought some books here today that are basically geared toward different grade levels. Okay. Um, so we're going to start towards the middle school era and work our way up towards upper high school. Sure. So one of the first books that I want to talk about is The Escape from Mr. Lemoncello's Library. And this is such a fun book to get students excited about reading. Kyle is a boy who loves games, board games, all that kind of stuff. And when his favorite designer is in charge of creating the new town library, him and 11 other kids get to spend the night in a special event. Okay. But the next morning, the doors are locked. And how can they get out? by solving puzzles that are all book related. So it's such a fun uh, yeah. book of adventure and twists and turns and clues that they're sure to keep reading to see how they get their way out. Very nice. It looks like a good size for a middle schooler. Yes, absolutely. Next up is New Kid by Jerry Craft. Uh, this is a graphic novel and it's about Jordan who is a new kid at a private school and he's one of the only students of color. And he's really being pulled from his home neighborhood and his new school environment. And as these two worlds are pulling him in different directions, it's really hard to figure out who are his people, who can he rely on. And I gotta say that this is one of the most accurate descriptions of a middle school experience that I've seen hmm. in fiction. And you said it's a graphic novel. Do you mind yes. if, if we take a look? Wow, so look at those illustrations. The, they're so good. And this could be a good way, I, I think, to get some students who are a little hesitant to read, especially if they're into comic books or into the visual aspect, yes. right? So this is, this is a nice uh, little stepping stone to maybe get you towards yeah. those novels. Absolutely. Beautifully illustrated. Uh, next up, uh, in the lower high school, 
Uh, so ninth and 10th grade. Okay. I've got this book called Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds. Uh, this book is written uh, in prose, in ver or it's written in verse. Hmm. So this is all a novel of poetry, which really makes it flow really quickly yeah. and you're not struggling through the pages. Um, so I think just because it's a quick page turner, you're gonna be more likely to get to the end. Yeah. But it's a very dramatic book. Um, 15 year old Will, his older brother has been shot and killed and the rules of his neighborhood are you must get revenge. Now, he's on his way to do that, but from his eight-story apartment down to the ground floor, this whole book takes place in one 60-second elevator ride. Wow. And as he goes level by level, he's joined by ghosts of other gun violence victims wow. who are trying to pull him in different directions to see which decision he's gonna make by the time he finally hits that lobby. That's incredible, and such a great tease. I wanna read that now, <laughs> and Perfect. great concept. Now, The Sunbearer Trials by Aiden Thomas, this is Percy Jackson meets Hunger Games, okay. but with um, Mexican uh, folklore and Mexican gods. Cool. So all of these demigods are uh, just living their lives, kind of being celebrities as their parents are gods. But every 10 years, there is a competition, a very deadly one, to help fuel the sun who keeps the dark gods away. So most of the uh, the semi-dioses, as they are called, are trained to participate in these activities. They want to be the champion. They want to have the playing cards after them, all that stuff. But the main character is not one of those. He's one of the, maybe a son of the minor god. So he's not getting as much attention, but he's randomly selected. Oh. And so now it's up to him, who's had no training and isn't really fully comfortable with his own identity to be shoved into the limelight and fight to the death in wow. some of these situations. So a lot of action, a lot yeah, of adventure. Page, page turner. So we are in later high school years yes. now, right? Okay. Um, so this is a book I actually teach with some of my um, 11th and 12th graders, uh, Dark Matter by Blake Crouch. This is a science fiction novel and every year I ask them which one was your favorite and they pick this book. So we have Jason who is a scientist and he has kind of picked the family route. He is teaching at the local college, he didn't really go through the award track and all that stuff, but then he's kidnapped and he wakes up in a totally new world where he is the Jason of career mode. He's won all those accolades. He's won everything. Ooh. And he's not really sure how he got there, but it turns out his parallel universe self has switched. He said, Ooh. I want what you have. I want the family life. You can go live in my career world. So now family Jason has to find his way across the multiverse to get back to that one where his wife and children exist. Love a parallel universe. Yeah. <laughs> That's just a great device in, in movies and TV and of course in books. And what's so fun is that he does have to travel to all of these different mm -hmm. worlds and they're so just vividly created and, and there portrayed. there are deep thoughts. There are life lessons baked into that story. Uh, so many things about choices and consequences and the road not traveled. Yeah. So they the definitely eat that book up. Wow, all right, finally. And finally, we have I'm the Messenger by Marcus Isaac. So Ed is kind of a loser. Uh, he's just a taxi driver who hangs out with his friends, has no goals, uh, poor relationship with his family. But that is until he starts receiving playing cards in the mail. And on the playing cards are clues to people that he must help. And so what he learns is that through helping and these missions from some secret sender, he's actually becoming a better person along the way. Hmm. So by the end of it, we see him grow in such a wonderful way um, to go from the beginning to the end. And it's also a great lesson of taking responsibility to help the community yeah. and help those around you and the kind of benefits that you can get from doing some of those things. Yeah, and those are lessons you can learn. That's growth you can experience. Kids Absolutely. can experience while Especially reading. in these later years when we're about to send them off from high school. Yeah. Um, you know, I have to put them out into the world and do they have the kind of lessons that I want them to have. Yeah, well these are great suggestions. I also want to hear, before we head to break, about this Instagram page that you have going. Tell us all about that. So I've been running Mr. D Reads for about two years now and it's such a joy. 
like so many other people online, I started it during the pandemic mm -hmm. when I just needed a creative outlet. I needed a spark of joy that I was not getting from anywhere else in 2020. So I started this account and it has been wonderful. It's such a beautiful little corner of the internet nice. where we just bond over books and the love of reading. And some of the online friendships that I'm able to create based on relationships that started with books, it's just so inspiring yeah. to say that like, this is your community, these are your people, uh, they are out there. And so like we were saying before that this misconception that reading is such an isolated activity that mm -hmm. you do in private, reading can be so social yeah. and form such great bonds. And what I love, one of my favorite activities is recommending books. So being able to say like, hey, I read this, have you read it? Oh, you read that, maybe I'll add that to my never ending to be yeah. read list. <laughs> uh, so if anyone wants to reach out, like I am more than happy to offer some recommendations. Yes. It's my favorite. And on your Instagram page, these are books for all ages. These are people of all ages, correct? Correct, yeah. I run the gambit. I'll, I'll read with my kids, I'll read adult books, yeah. uh, whereas some of my friends are very like, I am a romance only, I am a thriller sure. only, I'm a little bit of everything. Nice, very nice. And that's just Mr. D Reads, right? Correct. All right, easy to find. Go look them up on Instagram. Thank you again to Alexander Davidson for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. When we return, we will introduce you to a local nonprofit organization that's providing a life-changing opportunity for the blind and visually impaired. I don't know if there's been a better time to start a brand new news operation. The newsroom was pretty much starting from scratch. It's fresh, it's innovative. Lots of energy, lots of passionate reporters. Knowing what we're starting here puts so much joy in my heart. We have reporters who are embedded in these communities. Many people throughout St. Clair Shores have been fighting to save this water tower. If there's a miracle out there, get a hold of me. We are part of the neighborhood. Our newsroom is part of your neighborhood. Residents here on Stansbury say they are fed up with all this flooding that keeps happening. We shouldn't have to live like this. Telling the stories that otherwise nobody would know about. Now, AJ, you went to the downtown boxing gym and you yeah. really got to see how this gym is impacting kids' lives. Yeah, Chris, as soon as I walked in the building, it was very uplifting. It is a boxing gym, but it's more than boxing. You know, we do homework, we help them with the SAT. When it comes to the weather, it's forecasting what's going to fall on your driveway, when is it going to happen, and how might it actually affect your day-to-day -day life. Hundreds of people continue to call in reporting problems throughout the county. Cleanup crews working all throughout Metro Detroit. Get them down and get them cleaned up. Local news to me means we're in your community. We're telling stories that matter to you, that affect you, that maybe we can get change and things done in your community. She was born without a without an, a right arm, um, and then her legs didn't grow, I guess, the way that they should have. But for 20-year-old Fortson High School alum, Sumeya, she doesn't let that, or anything else for that matter, get in her way. So you have a favorite button over there. Yeah, you want to dress it. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and... This is my favorite. Well, I hope everyone watching that piece in particular says, I want to help that little girl and help that family and help get her to college. Well, we are rethinking the way local news is done in the 21st century and how to, how to tell the most important stories in a compelling way. You can get news anywhere, but for us, we're a fresh face with a new perspective and we're trying to make a difference in the community to tell stories that matter to you. I think we're here to listen and actually hear what you're saying and we're putting together a newscast that will show that. I want to tell those people stories because it's needed. Detroit is ready. Get ready because here we come. Reporting in Dearborn Heights. Live in Wayne County. Reporting in Adrian. Live in Livonia. Reporting from South Lyon, Kelly Vaughn. CBS, CBS News, News Detroit. Detroit. Welcome back. Seedlings Braille Books for Children is an organization working to provide free and low cost Braille books. It's based in Livonia and its volunteers and donors offer books for a fraction of what it costs to make them. Two years ago, we visited the store to learn about how these books are made and speak to some of those who are reading them. But go ahead and and start before the sun gets hot. When I did some research, I found that um, 
there were very few children's books available in Braille, and those that were available were exceedingly expensive, like $100 for a Hardy Boys book, which just didn't seem right to me. I wonder why she wants more weeds. So I um, decided to try to do something about that and make more books available, keeping the prices really affordable. We um, print the books and bind the books and then ship the books all over the United States and um, around the world, actually. Brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? I was born I blind, so blind. seedlings allowed me to start reading when I was young, like all my, like all the uh, other students in the school with me. And by giving me the foundation of literacy, it allows me to have a job in the professional world and be a software developer. Miss Emma is a grand woman. I think it's amazing. I think that it opens so many doors for so many families to be able to connect, makes the um, visually impaired kids and students feel less isolated. If we didn't have these books, then no one would be able to read. If Seedlings was not there and we didn't have any books. Imagine that. If we didn't have any print books, braille books, anything, we would not be able to read. It feels really good to know that, I, that I'm making a little bit of a difference in the world. Yeah. And joining us now is Amanda Hercula, co-production manager at Seedlings. Amanda, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. You guys are doing incredible work, and the organization has been for a few decades at this point. Yeah. For those who don't know, uh, how did Seedlings get its name? What does that name mean? So it comes from the idea of you plant the seed in the hands, and it sparks the growth in the child as they grow. So Seedlings, plant the seed, learn to read. Yeah, and it's a beautiful cause. I mean, the books themselves, it's not something those who are not visually impaired tend to think about, but it's not easy to just create them, is it? It's not, it's actually a very involved process and we make all of our books in-house. So they're all printed, bound, created completely by us. Um, so it is a long process and it's an expensive process, mm -hmm. which is why we're so grateful for our wonderful donors and supporters. Yeah, uh, you said it's expensive to create and I imagine just for your average family to build, you know, a small library for your child who needs them, that would be difficult to do, right? Yeah, absolutely, especially because Braille books aren't readily available in stores or libraries. So kids with visual impairments don't have the same access to books that a sighted child would have. So that's one of our goals is increasing that access and making books more easily accessible to those kids. So kind of walk us through this. For kids who are finally accessing them for the first time, maybe through seedlings, how can they even begin to, to develop that proficiency at learning Braille? Well, it's a process and a lot of uh, uh, visually impaired children have teachers and supporters who help them through the process. Uh, the earlier you can be exposed to Braille in, in your life is kind of the easier. So think about a sighted child would be exposed to words driving down the street, looking mm -hmm. at road signs or billboards. A visually impaired child might not have that same advantage. So being exposed to Braille at a very young age, even when they necessarily can't read it, but if they can touch it and get used to that feeling, it helps that learning process that much earlier. We were talking earlier about declining literacy rates and children overall, and for so many people that's shocking in this day and age. It seems like we have more information available to us. Do you know, has there been any similar decline uh, with visually impaired and blind children? Uh, it is very similar to print populations, although everything is kind of skewed towards, towards Braille, obviously, but mm -hmm. because Braille or visually impaired children don't have those same resources, it can be a, a lower instance rate. Yeah, uh, with all of the digital technology that we have, have there been advances that help children learn Braille more, more quickly or even help their families find organizations like Seedlings? Yeah, absolutely. Technology has come a long way and Braille itself has become even a more accessible thing. So there's uh, tech, technological devices that makes refreshable Braille, so it's not just on paper anymore, and lots of new um, opportunities for people to learn new things, new tools, new toys for ch kids to make learning fun and accessible, and lots of new um, uh, 
inventions and things, yeah. you know. What kind of uh, age range are we dealing with for the most part, and, and what variety of books? Yeah, so we serve ages, we say 0 to 21. We have three different types of books. The first is like a typical board book that you might find at a Barnes & Noble. So it has pictures and print words, but okay. then we add a clear plastic Braille label on them so you can feel that tactile Braille, but you also have the pictures and the print accompanying it. So that might be helpful for a child who has a little bit of vision or for sighted family members who can help learn the Braille. Sure. We also make books that have print and Braille with no pictures, like that are easy readers, chapter books, kind of for that you know, five to nine range. Yeah. And then we have fully Braille books, which are those longer books, longer full chapter books that are for more advanced readers. And uh, we have a note about uncontracted Braille versus contracted Braille. What does that mean? Yeah, so we use a system, America uses a system called Unified English Braille, and there's two different versions of that. So just like in the print word, there are contractions for a word like don't. There would be a contraction for a Braille word as well. So uncontracted would be every single letter spelled out for every single word, and you can imagine how long that book would be. Wordy, yes, quite literally. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so contractions go to make it a little shorter, a little easier to read as you get along in the Braille reading process. So a whole word might be represented by one Braille symbol or even a group of words. Would this be the Braille equivalent of like an abridged audio book? Similar. Okay. Similar concept. Sure. Uh, you guys have a lot of volunteers who work with Seedlings. What is their role? Yeah, we rely so much on our volunteers. We have a great volunteer base. They help us do things in our production area, like putting books together and binding the books. They also help us do things like fundraising, which we rely heavily on, so we're very thankful for them. And if people would like to get involved, what's the best way to go about that. Yeah, you can check out our website. It's www.seedlings.org. Um, give us a call. We're always looking for more people to help and join. And yeah, yeah. Well, you guys are doing great work. Thanks so much for coming by today. Thank you. All right. When we come back, we will be joined by an independent bookstore owner and a local author to talk about the state of the local bookstore. I don't know if there's been a better time to start a brand new news operation. The newsroom was pretty much starting from scratch. It's fresh, it's innovative. Lots of energy, lots of passionate reporters. Knowing what we're starting here puts so much joy in my heart. We have reporters who are embedded in these communities. Many people throughout St. Clair Shores have been fighting to save this water tower. If there's a miracle out there, get a hold of me. We are part of the neighborhood. Our newsroom is part of your neighborhood. Residents here on Stansbury say they are fed up with all this flooding that keeps happening. We shouldn't have to live like this. Telling the stories that otherwise nobody would know about. Now, AJ, you went to the downtown boxing gym and you yeah. really got to see how this gym is impacting kids' lives. Yeah, Chris, as soon as I walked in the building, it was very uplifting. It's a boxing gym, but it's more than boxing. You know, we do homework, we help them with the SAT. When it comes to the weather, it's forecasting what's going to fall on your driveway, when is it going to happen, and how might it actually affect your day-to-day -day life. Hundreds of people continue to call in reporting problems throughout the county. Cleanup crews working all throughout Metro Detroit. Get them down and get them cleaned up. Local news to me means we're in your community, we're telling stories that matter to you, that affect you, that maybe we can get change and things done in your community. She was born without a without an, a right arm, um, and then her legs didn't grow, I guess, the way that they should have. But for 20-year-old Fortin High School alum, Sumeya, she doesn't let that, or anything else for that matter, get in her way. So you have a favorite button over there. Yeah, you want to press it. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and... This is my favorite. Well, I hope everyone watching that piece in particular says, I want to help that little girl and help that family and help get her to college. Well, we are rethinking the way local news is done in the 21st century and how to, how to tell the most important stories in a compelling way. You can get news anywhere, but for us, we're a fresh face with a new perspective and we're trying to make a difference in the community to tell stories that matter to you. I think we're here to listen and actually hear what you're saying and we're putting together a newscast that will show that. I want to tell those people stories because it's needed. Detroit is ready. Get ready because here we come. Reporting in Dearborn Heights. Live in Wayne County. Reporting in Adrian. Live in Livonia. Reporting from South Lyon, Kelly Vaughn. CBS, CBS News, News Detroit. Detroit.
Welcome back. Nowadays, the phrase a book that's too good to put down has somewhat of a different meaning. From ebooks to audiobooks, there are so many ways to read without actually going to a bookstore. Now research shows bookstore sales are declining. According to the economic census, bookstore sales dropped by nearly $2 billion between 2012 and 2017. Meanwhile, independent bookstores generated nearly $400 million in sales in 2018, which is an average of $41,000 per bookstore. Joining us now are Carrie Lauren, owner of the BookBeat Bookstore in Oak Park, as well as award-winning playwright and author Stephen Mac Jones. Thank you both for being here today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I would. I'll start with you, uh, Carrie. Tell me about how sales have been, how things have been in your business in the past few years. Uh, I think the books are, in our case, I can't speak for every bookstore, but things go up and down, and it's not very predictable. They they've been mostly down, I think. In, uh, I mean, the pandemic was a, was a big problem for us um, to get through, and most recently it's been kind of very slow time. Uh, I think retail in general is kind of slow right now. Yeah, you've seen a lot of changes in the industry. I mean, you opened your store in the 80s. Right. We have since seen the advent of the internet and e-readers and yeah. all kinds of things that affect you. Of course, there's a, like certain... Uh, large Goliath online presence mm -hmm. of, a, of a bookseller I, I won't mention the name of. <laughs> but uh, I think that's a big uh, uh, problem for independent bookstores to deal with. And, uh, you know, so, so I think the bookstore, though, is a different type of thing. It's a different type of interaction where people come in to browse and to, um, you know, really serendipity works in this you know they, they like to discover things on their yeah. own and sometimes we like to sell what we enjoy reading or have suggestions yeah. we've been talking about declining literacy rates Stephen, as a, a playwright an author how do you react when you hear that fewer and fewer people f kids are struggling to read and fewer people are reading books the older they get it's discouraging um, there are just so many ways that uh, so many things that are calling for our attention, mm -hmm. uh, streaming services, um, gaming, online gaming, phone gaming, things that are uh, demanding our attention. And I think kids are feeling that. They're feeling splintered by all of these offerings, all of these distractions. Um, so it is discouraging, but because of people like Carrie and bookstores like BookBeat, um, and there are a number of independent bookstores uh, in the Metro Detroit area, they're very proactive as far as reaching out to the community. Mm -hmm. uh, getting young people to read. So I'm encouraged by that. Yeah, tell me about that, Gary. What You're proactive in what ways? Well, I, I brought some books to, yeah. that I could kind of illustrate. So, I mean, these are authors. This is a, a, a recent book, a first novel, novelist from Detroit, uh, Denise Crittenden, who we're hosting at the Oak Park Library uh, tomorrow night at uh, 7 p.m. Very nice. So, so we try to get, get, get newsletters out. I mean, we try to promote online mm -hmm. as much as we can through social media and face, you know, that thing to try to yeah. bring people into the store. Um, so there are a lot of interesting writers. Um, she's written an Afrofuturist novel. Um, we have a book club that we promote uh, kind of world lit literacy, world uh, World writing, uh, books in translation, basically, sure. uh, and so we're we we have this group. Uh, we we've been meeting in person for years, but after the pandemic, we started meeting online, and it's been it's been working out. People uh, from all over have been able to reach us and yeah. not worry about parking or you know to other other problems. Right, and um, we this is a, a another thing we're doing events a lot, a lot of in-store events. We're starting to do that again. 
where we couldn't before. And so, uh, We've been talking about how reading can be, or at least can be seen as such an isolating activity, but I mean, even in this conversation now, it, it does seem rather social. What is that community like, and what do you think people get out of reading with friends, essentially? Yeah, I, I think it's a great thing, because everyone has a different uh, approach when they read a book, and a different kind of idea about the book, and you just, it's about sharing that that with a group that's really, uh, it's really unique and it's really a kind of a different uh, way of looking through through books and you know seeing everyone's interpretation of the book. Yeah. It's and it's also like taking a vacation with friends. Right. Uh, you've gone to the same destination um, and had fun, adventure, but everyone has a different viewpoint mm -hmm. of that adventure. Everybody has a different, uh, something that they take away differently yeah. from that same reading vacation. And it's exciting to share that. Um, I've been in BookBeat uh, when there are kids there and I think this is part of uh, a lot of independent bookstores, when kids are there, the staff, um, they're very attentive to those kids mm -hmm. and getting them excited about reading. And that's something that yeah. I've seen. Oh. Yeah. At Book My wife, Colleen, is kind of the, the kind of magic behind all that. And she, um, is it, she reads so much, you yeah. know, I mean, uh, uh, more than I do, more than anyone I know probably, but, you know, although they're children's books, she's aware of what they are, and, yes. and she can give them to teachers and to, to parents and help their kids, you know, get through yeah. uh, lots, of, lots of things yes. in life. It's that much yeah. more special to find kids or have kids find a love of reading this day and age when it's so easy to find one of those distractions, to do anything but reading. You even mentioned during the commercial break, uh, TikTok, some of the social oh, yeah. media has actually been helpful in this process. I think I think to, to some extent. I mean, I think I'm not seeing a lot of really high quality books being promoted on, on TikTok, yeah. but I think there, there are books like romances and, mm -hmm. and things that are, you know, escapist kind of reading, um, no offense. <laughs> is that a, is that a, but reading can no, be about no, escapism no, in a way, no, can't no, it? No, it's a positive thing. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, putting it down. But I think that it's, it's a, I haven't gotten used to it. I don't use TikTok. It's not, it's, it's kind of a, a, you know, I think it's more of a, a young adult, maybe yeah. children friendly uh, um, medium, sure. social. Yeah. Uh, activity. When we talk about escapism though, that's kind of one of the selling points I would think for a lot of people. I mean, everyone's used to binging television shows, maybe discussing with yes. your friends yeah. that same show. This is in some ways a deeper way to kind of dive into something. Right. And I escape. like to push yes. people more, you know, a little further than their comfort yeah. uh, zone. And I've seen that with uh, my books, um, the thrillers that I write, the response from uh, readers uh, throughout the United States, uh, the UK, uh, Germany has been uh, extraordinary yeah. uh, to the point that I got a um, email from a gentleman in Australia who had read my first book um, and he ended the email by saying that uh, Detroit was on his bucket list. Well, there, there's, a, nice. there's a big love of Detroit all over the world. Yes. Yeah. And, and Stephen's books had, are you know, very Detroit-centric. They're, you know, August Snow and, um, and yeah. I, yeah. So it's, it's, it's no wonder he was, you know, I don't know if we the, could tell the story here, but uh, if you have time about uh, Harvey Weinstein who called him once. Uh. <laughs> about his uh, first Well, we book. can't just say that and not. If we can quickly <laughs> tell the story, I suppose. Yes, I, I don't know if you, go ahead. Um, my it's first a, book, uh, the title is August Snow, and published by Soho Press. I just had to throw that in there. Okay. But um, I got a call from my agent about two months after it was, uh, uh, two months before it was released. 
And she said, do you have time to speak with this producer uh, about the book? He's produced film and TV. And, uh, you know, I looked at my watch. I looked at the recycling that I had to separate. And I said, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I can make time for this guy. Well, to make a long story short, um, I talked twice to Harvey Weinstein. Mm. He was very excited about the book, et cetera, and so forth. After the second time, he said, I'll call you in a week, and we'll talk some decisions. Well, a week went by, two weeks went by, a month. And it turns out he had other things <laughs> occupying his time. Yeah, I imagine this was a few years ago, several yes. years ago? Yes. Well, we know how that went. Um, wow. Yes. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, we know your stories are, are really influencing people, powerful people, people around the world. But there's, there's also a... a is it is that off the TV? Is that a HBO thing or something or a TV? Some uh, TV thing we're, that picked it up. Is this some insider information? Well, coming? there there are three books in the series. The fourth one will be coming in November okay. of this year, and um, it's it's gone through a few production companies okay. uh, in Hollywood. So we're still. Um, I get an option, the option goes away, I sure. get another option, but um, it's a world, uh, Hollywood is a world that um, is extraordinarily confusing, yeah. frustrating, Sure. Uh, and I'm a Midwest guy, I'm a Michigan <laughs> guy, give it to me straight. <laughs> right, you know? right. Well, it sounds like it's very possible that in the near future, or some, some future, we may see some of your Detroit-centric Detroit work uh, on the screen. So we'll keep an eye out for that, absolutely. Uh, I want to thank Stephen and Carrie. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. We really appreciate thank your you. time. And when we return, Ahmed will be back with one final look at your forecast.